You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. You Died Sai. Dr. Yu Dai Tsai received his PhD in physics at Cornell University and followed that with being a research associate at Fermi Lab. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher at UCI. Dr. Tsai's research focuses on particle physics, astroparticle physics, and cosmology. Yu Dai Tsai, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's a wonderful opportunity. Now, you, you have a new paper out using known asteroids, looking at known asteroids, as in your paper, yep. to probe whether or not there is a fifth force of nature. Could you lay that, that premise out? The asteroids that were studied for this paper are nine of the near-Earth asteroids. So because they are near-Earth, they are measured very, very precisely. They are near Earth as near as like, they are near the sun in, within one AU. So they are basically very, very close to the Earth. So we can actually shoot radar to it. So the advantage is that we can do optical measurement and radar measurement. And you know, because we can do radar, we can get its distance very well. And we can get its velocity very well by doing Doppler. And it's so precise that we can do to the 10 to the minus nine fractional uncertainty. Meaning that if I have five times the five times 10 to the nine meter of distance from us, I can measure it as precise as 40 meter, extremely precise. And this example, I, I didn't just throw it out randomly. This is the example for KW1999. Uh, mashup. So there is an asteroid that is a binary asteroid that we can measure very well. And okay, so so that's why we choose these near-Earth asteroids. And actually it's studied by a UCRA group earlier, which I will mention that uh, when we talk about our actual analysis. Another thing I also want to mention is that, so the reason why we really need to study these asteroids is also because they can hit us, right? These near-Earth asteroids. They can, they can bomb into us. They can kill us like dinosaur. Most likely dinosaurs are killed by near Earth asteroids. So we have to track them very, very, very precisely. And recently I invited uh, a researcher at, at the European Space Agency, Mark, uh, Dr. Marco Michelli, to give us a talk at Fermilab about all these amazing new measurement about asteroids and near Earth asteroids, how good we can track them. And it's a fascinating talk. And uh, yeah, so this is basically what I want to say. And because they can be measured so precisely through optical and radar study, we can use that to constrain the fifth force, which uh, we'll get into more. Uh, I, I think you can, yeah. Now, before we get there, the idea that, <laughs> well, number one, we have to track asteroids, as you say, because we could, that could be our extinction event. And I can't think of anything worse than waking up one day with a gigantic asteroid burning through the atmosphere, smacking into Earth, and then the, 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 the long dying period that the dinosaurs went through. But let me ask you this. Okay, so how do we radar track asteroids now? Now, I know we used to be able to do it with Arecibo. Yep. And obviously, Arecibo is, is gone. Um, right. Hopefully, we'll replace it. But there's also FAST. And does FAST have the ability to radar asteroids similar to Arecibo being a similar telescope? Does it have, is it equipped or is, is it planned to be equipped with equipment to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So FAST is certainly now uh, could have the potential to do that. But currently, uh, the most uh, commonly used one is the Ghost Stone. So there is this Ghost Stone Observatory that you can do all this radar astronomy. Uh, yeah, you can use it. So recent, right now, I think we're mostly relying on ghost stone. But certainly, I think it's interesting to consider uh, fast. I actually am not familiar with how good we can do with fast. So that's something I can do more 
research on and I can report back. Or we can invite someone from uh, FAST to talk about this. But that I actually don't know. Uh, it's oh, yeah, that's, you can, that's that's all yeah. definitely in the cards. Fast is is certainly on my radar because that is now our, our globally speaking our biggest radio telescope, mm-hmm. and um, I'm watching with great interest what they're planning to do with it, especially with Insetti. I mean that's that's a big telescope, right. <laughs> and interesting stuff can be done. Now the fifth force. Give us an overview within physics of of the idea of a fifth force of nature fifth force has a very long history so there has been many many different kind of fifth force either it's long range or short range has been proposed so first of all what is the fifth force so in our standard model we know there are well known four kind of forces of course they are related but we kind of separate them into four just for a conversation or for discussion so first there is Gravity, there is gravitational force. And there is electromagnetism. And then there is strong force and there is weak force. Now for the gravity is very different, but the other three kind of force, the, the reason why I say they are related is because uh, they are all from a standard model of particle physics. And there are have always been proposal to unify these different, these three different force from particle physics. And also there are attempts to unify all different four forces. So it's a very interesting subject that we can talk about the other day. But the fifth force is saying that maybe there is a different kind of force that is fundamental and can mediate either a short range force or long range force. So this is a interesting possibility. And there are, let's say in the string theory, people predict very light particle then this very light particle, they can mediate fifth force. Or in some, uh, I know you guys are interested in the dark energy models. There are some dark energy, dark energy model also predict ultra light particle that can give you long range fifth force. I'm less familiar with dark energy, so you can invite my collaborators to, to talk about that. Oh, actually, I will also introduce my collaborator right after uh, my statement about fifth force. And finally, you can relay this fifth force to dark matter. So because if you have very light particle, they can mediate very long range fifth force, and they can also be dark matter themselves. So if they're dark matter themselves, they can you, then you can uh, affect the evolution of the universe. So it's very interesting. And these dark matter are called fuzzy dark matter because they are very fuzzy. So I'm kind of, kind of familiar with dark matter. So if you're interested in some other dark matter candidates, I can say a few words, but certainly this is a kind of like hot topic that people are looking at into this ultra light dark ultra light particle, and a lot of this ultra light particle can mediate fifth force. Now, ultra light particles. So this would be a wimp, right? Weakly interacting, something like that. So this is in that that grain, right? No, no. Uh, so uh, so these are certainly very weakly interacting, but when people talk about wimp. So WIMP is a very heavy handed word, but when people talk about WIMP, most of the time they're saying this particle kind of goes through something called freeze out through weak interaction. So these ultra light particles, they don't necessarily go through this. Actually, they cannot go through this because if they go through this freeze out process, they will likely uh, have a very strong effect on cosmological measurement. So they are heavily constrained. So this ultralight particle, this ultralight particle or fuzzy dark matter, they cannot be WIM or they cannot be the traditional WIM. They are different class of uh, dark matter candidates. So we have candidates for matter that we cannot see. Mm-hmm. And when you throw in dark energy, we're talking most of the universe is this dark material. Do you think that the fifth force is relevant in determining the behavior of this matter and what it actually is. In other words, does the existence of 90 something percent of the universe being invisible, does this require a fifth force of nature? I mean, do we have to actively go looking or can we simply say, well, no, it's either there or it's not, we'll find it. But the reality is, is that we have all this dark energy and dark matter and it, it, 
it may not care. <laughs> yeah, it might not care. Actually, I don't think、uh, so. This force is cool by itself. Dark energy is cool by itself.、Uh, they do not need to actually relate to, to each other. And dark energy can just be, as you said, just the curvature of the universe. It doesn't really necessarily need a lot of new physics. But since we are interested in new physics, so we like to connect them and see if there are new、uh, measurement that will come out of it that we can measure. But certainly, dark energy and、uh, fist force does not at all needs to be linked to each other. It's just the link is interesting. The unification of the forces. So, if if we were to find, and there are some you know indications floating around, especially、mm-hmm. Fermi Lab, that maybe there is a fifth force of nature. But we also know that the forces unify at certain energies at certain points, and that begs a question: Do you have to have a unification of all forces? So can can there be the four forces of nature, or maybe three forces of nature that unify, but then gravity and the fifth force may not? Is that a situation where it, it may not actually be a manifestation of all the same thing? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, and all of these possibility were kind of、uh, studied at some point. So first, let's we can talk about. So yeah, as you mentioned, the Fermi Lab,、uh, there are some new measurement that could suggest some new particle that can give us this force that is heavily being investigated. And my asteroid paper does not necessarily related to that. It does actually doesn't related to that, but it's kind of interesting. They are both fifth force, but they are very different kind of fifth force. But to directly answer your question, people have proposed this grand unification theory that can unify all the particle physics、uh, three forces, but we actually don't have evidence for that. So. We most of the theories like that idea, and、uh, the idea is very compatible with string theory. So we all very are very interested in that, and we're very interested in investigating that. But currently, there is no direct evidence of grand unification, grand unification theory. Now, to unify gravity is even more complicated, and it's above my pay grade, so I don't want to、uh, say too much. But certainly, the attempt is, is is very interesting and bring us a lot of、uh, fortune in knowledge in our knowledge base. And once we develop this knowledge, we can also use it on other thing. But、uh, so, and your question is, can some of the forces be unified and some of them are not? It's definitely possible. And and、uh, one of the best example is the 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 weak force is kind of directly related. So there you have this.、Uh, S U two cross U one, and their symmetry breaking is breaking together. So even though they are different, different fundamental group. Oh,、uh, sorry, they are different kind of a, a kind of a kind of force, and but they have very similar. They they give you the electroweak symmetry breaking that at the same scale. So that's something that is very interesting. So、uh, to sum up. There are, there are, these are all interesting possibility to consider. Maybe some of the forces are unified, some of them are not, and it's worth a lot of study. And no evidence is suggesting there is a grand unification theory. Your paper in regards to asteroids、yeah. and probing the fifth force, if if if, if it's there, what is the mechanics of that? So, how do you look at an asteroid、mm-hmm. and try to determine if there if it's exhibiting behavior, presumably in its motion, that there is a A force that we're unaware of interacting with it, right? So that's a great question. So, so let's also come back to the idea of precession or perihelion precession. So precession means different things in physics and in astronomy, and let's focus on the definition in astronomy. The definition of precession in astronomy is when you、uh, each time your astro、uh, astrophysical body. Rotates around certain thing or orbits around certain thing. For example, the sun. Each time after your orbit, the optical parameter will change a little bit. That's the general idea of、uh, precession. And today we focus on so the thing that we focus on is something called perihelion precession. So perihelion precession is saying that、uh, the the perihelion is the nearest point to the Let's say for for the to the sun. For so when asteroids are orbiting around the sun, 
the closest point is called perihelion. Each time the asteroid rotates around the sun, the, the perihelion will change a little bit. And that's what perihelion precession is. And same for Mercury, and that's how we uh, have a successful general relativity. And for asteroid, there's also general relativity effect. So the idea is that if you have a fixed force that is long range, but not infinitely long, then you will also induce precession. And this precession, if you can determine it, then you can find fixed force. But it's extremely hard because there's a lot of uh, different effect that can give you things look like a precession. But the flip side is you could constrain that. And if you can control all the perturbation, maybe you can find it. But more conservative, conservatively, you can constrain them. And uh, so pre uh, perihelion precession is one of the tools that we can use to constrain new physics like a fifth force. But I also want to mention that pre perihelion precession is just one of these. There are many, many different measurements. And actually, a lot of these near-Earth asteroids can be tracked extremely precisely by radar and optical measurement. Thus, you know almost its whole trajectory. So if there's a fifth force, you will directly affect the whole trajectory. And that's why we are actually collaborating with NASA physicist, Dr. Davide Farnocchia, that he's very good at uh, doing all this uh, uh, calculation and doing simulation of this trajectory of asteroids. And we hope to uh, hope that he can help us and we can implement this long range force effects into the code that uh, they use by NASA actually. We have what's called the flyby anomaly, which is a yeah. sort of transient phenomena where spacecraft that shoot by Earth and slingshot out to wherever we're sending them sometimes show a discrepancy. And it seems to be pretty convincing that there is some kind of discrepancy going on because it's happened to multiple spacecraft, but sometimes it doesn't seem to show itself. Do you think that looking at the a fifth force is fruitful there in figuring out what that discrepancy is, or is it probably something that we should look at geophysically? That's a great question. And uh, my, I can give a very quick answer that is most likely geophysics or some thermal physics, but let's also understand uh, these flyby anomaly a little bit more. So, so you can first ask the same question, right? So why asteroid and why not? Uh, why do I study asteroid and why do I not study spacecraft for this reason? Because you can use spacecraft to do fixed force in principle, but the, there's a big difference. These spacecrafts are very small, and they are subject to a lot of perturbation. So a lot of these flyby anomalies could be caused by the solar thermal effect. Like these things are shine on the, the, the sunlight is shining on it, and there's an emission, and you affect this trajectory and acceleration, or its own source, right? Because these these uh these spacecrafts they have power source, and the power source will give you a expected uh, acceleration, but they will also give you unexpected acceleration from the heat source. So there's a lot of complicated things that people have to consider. For asteroids, is a little, a little bit cleaner, although asteroids also have the solar thermal effects. Since they're typically much larger, let's say larger than one kilometer, so the effect is much smaller. And they also don't have their own power source, so there's less of this perturbation from that. So because of that, asteroids is a little bit better in probing fixed force than a, a spacecraft. But now your question is very interesting. Can we use fifth force to explain this flyby anomaly? I, it's very tough, right? It's very hard because uh, the usual, uh, usual fifth force model give it a very gradual change. It doesn't give you a sharp change. So maybe there are some very weird model that can give you that. But I haven't done the study, so I cannot say too much. But it's certainly something interesting to think about. But I wouldn't certainly bet my money. I wouldn't bet my money on uh, fixed force being the reason for the five by anomaly. <laughs> it's not uh, not something I would. Uh... I don't have a lot of money to bet, but that's just my phrase of saying how much I believe in those uh, those things. 
Always bet a cup of coffee because it's <laughs> yeah. Oh, cup of coffee, yes. I wouldn't even bet my cup of coffee on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, do we see so. with with the near Earth asteroids that you're interested in? Right. Do we do you do we see perturbations that are unexplained? Um, but again, we were talking about Planet Nine and outer solar system objects are perturbed, which leads to the suspicion that something may be there. Do we see anything like that with the near Earth asteroids that you study? Not really, right?、Uh, so, all these near Earth objects are tracked extremely precisely, and everything almost follow what is、uh, expected. But I also want to comment on the perturbation, right? So, what are the perturbation? So, per- perturbation are the solar solar thermal effects and the the gravitational source from the other nearby objects, including even the Earth or Jupiter, whatever Mercury, anything. So, there is a code called Monte M O N T E, which is mo-、uh, mission, operation, navigation, toolkit. Environment, and this is developed by NASA, and it's also used by this UCLA group, which inspired us to do this asteroid study on Fifth Force, which we will talk about a little bit more later. But anyway, so so this Monty thing is very powerful in modeling all these different perturbation, because if you don't do it properly, how can you know if an asteroid is hitting us, right? The nearest asteroid. If you don't, if you cannot predict its trajectory. Then you cannot like sleep at night because what if、uh, one of these hits us in like the event in Russia, which I think we'll mention a little bit. Like the in 2013, there's an unexpected asteroid that hits Russia, so that one was not expected. So since then, there's a lot of advances in both simulation and this modeling of the、uh, trajectory and also the tracking. So both have a lot of advances, and that's why now. It starts to allow us to probe things very precisely, like the fifth force. For some reason,、mm-hmm. probably due to enormous landmass, Russia is subject to getting hit by meteorites of substantial size. It's happened, to my knowledge, three times in a century. You had the Tunguska event, and then you had、um, <laughs> that an iron meteorite basically come in. Explode like a grenade and spread itself across、uh, an entire mountainside with all these just tiny fragments. I think in 1947 or 1949, and then now Chelyabinsk, which everybody I'm sure on that watches this channel looked at all of the YouTube videos of windows getting broken and all of this. So we also see over the oceans. Which is the much greater area of of this earth? We also see these things regularly, gigantic, potentially damaging meteorite impacts. Exactly. So, yeah. So these are objects that are dangerous, even if it isn't the size of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs or comet. Yep. So space poses a threat in this regard. Do you think? That we will ever be able to track smaller objects that can create damage, like Chelyabinsk, and mitigate those threats. Do you think that we would ever be able to create a small asteroid meteorite object detection and net, and be able to、uh, make sure that doesn't happen anymore? So we already had that, right? So、uh, Marco gave us, as I told you, Marco Michelli gave us a very nice talk. Yeah, there is this network of the whole globe is tracking these near Earth asteroids, and actually, yeah, like I can say, yeah, we need to do better because、uh, we might get killed. But nowadays, like, there's not a lot of、uh, asteroids that they found that can actually eliminate、uh, or or like make us extinct. Actually, so I think there's some. Index, so you can ask.、Uh, I I will I will tell you Marco's contact, and he can tell you how many of these、uh, could in could potentially impact us. The risk now is not very high. Like it's most likely we will not die because of some or die because of some asteroid. But the smaller one, as you say, yes, they could hit the Earth, and they could hit us in many places. But now our tracking is very well. So、uh, this Chalbinski, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Is less likely to is like less likely to surprise us, so most likely we'll catch that catch that, 
And before it happens, we can evacuate people. So I think uh, nowadays it's already very good. And it's very cool to do these kind of near Earth tracking uh, because you need collaboration between different telescopes. Because these these near Earth objects are very faint because the only reflection, the only light source it has is a reflection of the sunlight. So you need to track it with different telescope and very diligently to track them. So it's a very interesting practice. And I know this is an interesting topic for you. That's how we found the uh, Oumuamua, if I pronounce it correctly, because they are tracking the near Earth objects. And Oumuamua is also very faint. It's also almost like an asteroid, and that's why they can see it. And of course, Oumuamua is not a near Earth object, or it's also not really a normal asteroid. It's an interstellar object, as you guys study a lot. So uh, I'm not gonna say too much. But the near Earth asteroid tracking has bring up this groundbreaking uh, discovery of Oumuamua. Now, what does the LSST Vera Rubin Observatory offer us? As once that gets, once that reaches first light, can we study near Earth objects with it? And can you use that for your work in determining if uh, maybe there's evidence of a fifth force? Yep, definitely. So the 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 help from those uh, telescope is not direct but rather indirect so first of all it will increase how much asteroid we find so vera rubin observatory as we look up in in when we wrote our paper it can roughly increase the total observed object by five times of course it depends on if it's near earth or further away but roughly five times more so that's the first thing you can have more object Secondly, there is another kind of telescope or space telescope called Gaia. So Gaia provides a very good kind of, I would call it sky map or star map that when you do the optical observation of the asteroids, because it itself doesn't really have too much light and it's hard to optically determine its location. But now you have the star map. You can actually use that to much more precisely uh, determine the location of these uh, asteroids. And my friend uh, Marco would call this a uh, um, like a game changer because how much better this has uh, has uh, has improved uh, has helped us. By the way, I should say my collaborator's name. That it's important to 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 say the name of my collaborator. Can can I say it now? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So for the asteroid paper, uh, uh, I, I'm at Fermi Lab and. Uh, moving to UC Irvine and my collaborator is Yu Jia Wu, who is a PhD student in the University of Michigan, and Sonny Vignozzi, who is a postdoc, Dr. Sonny Vignozzi, who is a postdoc at uh, Cambridge. And uh, Dr. Luca Vissellini, actually now a professor, Luca Vissellini, is a researcher at INFN, which is Italy uh, laboratory for nuclear physics. But he also accepted a professorship at the uh, uh, Chongdao Li Institute in Shanghai, uh, Jiao Tong University. So this is truly a international collaboration exploring this new idea. And of course, we only did an estimation for the fifth force for asteroid, but this will lead to a lot of new studies along this direction. Yeah, thanks. Now, looking at asteroids mm -hmm. and studying near-Earth asteroids mm -hmm. is complicated because they can do some pretty strange stuff now, but, but at the same time, it's still Newtonian physics. So we can kind of understand exactly what's going on, but what threats to earth do these present that we may not be able to um, predict? For example, um, is it size? You know, I mean, is there a size limit on the asteroid that we can, observe or what what near earth asteroids barring comets coming and careening through the mm -hmm. solar system the outer solar system in the inner solar system do we have a complete handle on the physics and what constrains us from determining threats to earth from asteroid falls yeah that's a great question so i would say most of the near earth asteroids we have a really great uh, control of because they are 
like made of iron, nickel, all these things, they are very much more stable. They are not like comets. Comets are much more complicated because they will mill, they will, they will have all these tail and shape and then affect its trajectory. Asteroids are way better control, constrain, uh, controlled for these, uh, but especially for the asteroid. And uh, uh, if you chat with Marco, so we study the, the, the the fifth force project there were like nine asteroid being used by us and was was used by this ucra group that's why we use we recast their results but but uh there are two thousands of the near earth asteroid that can be tracked as good as these nine asteroids so i actually don't think that uh uh that we they will surprise us uh for the for the near future actually i think uh most of these asteroids it's if they are going to hit us we can actually evacuate very fast. And based on what Marco said, the precision is amazing. It's like 200 meters. So we, within 200 meters, we can determine if it's going to hit us or not. So we can evacuate this whole 200 meter uh, radius and people can be safe. So this is a respectable work done by all these people from NASA and ESA, and we owe our uh, safety to them. And I also want to join them once I get this uh, work running. So let me also say something kind of fun and speculative and kind of crazy. Uh, this doesn't have to be believed by any audience. So one thing I want to say though is, can I say something that, what is the, why do I study these fixed force or some new physics? One very unlikely scenario, very unlikely, is some of these new physics like dark matter or fixed force affect the trajectory of these near earth objects too much in an un unexpected way that maybe will cause them to hit us now this is very unlikely because we already constrained a lot of these fixed force and new physics very well but we didn't study all the different scenario right so some scenario might give us unpredicted results so that's one motivation i motivate myself to study this uh, new physics scenario of course, it's very, very unlikely, as I keep emphasizing. Most likely, we will not be killed because of some new physics is fat. But as someone who is uh, trying to be creative or trying to use this asteroid to study new physics, uh, I have to also say that it's not completely impossible. <laughs> it's very unlikely, but it's not completely impossible. I think the one that, that, that I actually fear more as far as unknowns is if the universe tunnels to its lowest oh, yeah. energy state <laughs> we are not going to survive that <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting thing like that doesn't come into my conscious but uh that's actually could be a possibility it depends on how much we understand higgs right but uh, that's an interesting thing to think about like why am i not worried about it i, I maybe because i have faith in certain certain these potential study but it's still a possibility so that's well, the, the statistical chances yeah. of it doing it at such a time for you right. to be alive are, are very low. And the other thing about that is, is that we would never see it coming. It would hit us at the speed yeah. of light and we would not even know. So we would just be gone. And then some other form, we, we'd end up as some other form of matter altered, you know, <laughs> altered by the expanding bubble of the uh, universe uh, changing itself. But right. at the same time, it's been here for 13.8 billion years and it hasn't done it. So we're probably yeah. safe. And, and maybe that's the same with asteroids because, look, we have events like Chelyabinsk and we have things like that. But as far as this, a, a, an extinction event, hasn't happened for 66 million years yeah, it's very rare yeah definitely so one could say that the solar system system is full of small objects mm -hmm. but the bigger it gets the more scarce it is right exactly yeah so that's another thing i want to mention which i haven't so why do we study asteroid it's also to help us understand the evolution the solar system why are we here like not not in the philosophical sense but in the real like the scientific sense like why are we why why is earth like this and why are all these planets like these and one there are certainly many different theory and it's very complicated so i will not say too much 
but uh, people are uh, the 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 leading theory are saying that the the reason why these asteroids are so small mostly is because the big object like Jupiter formed. And Jupiter is stopping this heavier object from forming. That's why we only have nine planets, and uh, the asteroids are of its size. Uh, I'm not an expert in solar system evolution. I know some experts, so I can suggest them to you. But but this is fascinating for me, right? Because I I I'm interested in study galaxy formation. But now when we study, so when you study stars, you can study galaxy formation. Now, if you study asteroid, you can study solar system evolution. So these are fascinating topics to me. Now, solar system evolution, um, which also involves numbers. In other words, there was a time that the late heavy bombardment where there were much greater numbers. Mm-hmm. So what what does that look like? I mean, let me phrase it a little bit differently. Over geologic time, does mm-hmm. the threat of an asteroid hitting the planet lessen? That's a great question. So I actually don't know, but I want to study that actually. So I was thinking about this, and well, I, I was I mean to ask uh, Marco about this. So, so in principle, now we have certain idea of all these objects, and uh, human history is very limited, but we can trace back to ancient Chinese people, ancient Greek people. They all have this tracking of these events. So with all this study, can we kind of understand the evolution of even possibility of us being hit by asteroids, or what? Uh, how does this fit in the long history of uh, solar evolution? So that's a fascinating question to me. I, I don't have an answer, but that's something we can study. If you're interested, we can write a paper. I don't know. I don't know if you have time, but uh, it's interesting to to think about this. I always have time for writing, <laughs> although people shouldn't cite me on scientific papers, though, because I'm 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 not worth it. <laughs> everybody's uh, everybody's uh, can yeah yeah. Now let me ask you this. Okay, so studying asteroids and looking at them, looking for a fifth force, sometimes mm-hmm. it can be useful to take a, a broader look at something yep. like that. So can you look? at other star systems like protoplanetary disks and things like that, and perhaps look for indications on a macro scale of what you're looking for. Definitely. Yeah. So that's a comment I want to make as well. So first of all, let's start with asteroids. So we have talked about uh, kind of uh, a lot about why we use asteroid, right? It's because how precise they can be measured for the near Earth one. But first, Right off the bat, I can say, I don't need just to study near Earth one. Why don't I study further away one? And why is it interesting to s- study things further away? It's because, so if you open uh, my paper, the precession induced by this force is actually larger depending on the typical radius for a certain limit. So there's an analytical limit that we can take and then there's an analytical formula and uh, if the fist force is kind of longer or if the particle is lighter, and then if you have the asteroid that you study are a little bit further away from the sun, then it's actually uh, the precession actually is larger depending on the semi-major axis. So sorry, let me say it uh, more organ- in a more uh, organized way. So if you consider objects further away from the sun, the fist force contribution on the precession is actually stronger when it's further away from the sun for a certain limit, for a certain analytical limit. So that's very interesting. So that is why people never really study uh, further away objects for GR. Because for the general relativity, if you look at the term, we have the term in our equation five, which is taken from the, the, the UCLA group paper, the Verma, uh, Jean-Luc Margot and uh, and uh, Greenberg paper. So the GR effect is actually large. Uh, it's actually smaller when your typical radius is larger. Meaning that if you want to study GR, you can stick to Mercury because Mercury is almost the best. And if you don't like Mercury, you, you only need to find object that is even nearer to the to the Sun. That's even better because their effect is larger. But for fifth force, it's the opposite. It actually prefer for certain parameter space, it actually prefer further away objects 
So there is this interesting thing, and that's why we should study objects further away, like man-built uh, asteroids or Trojan. Trojan has other interesting features because uh, Jupiter will also have fifth force effect on the Trojans if there is a fifth force. And furthermore, you can also study TNO, right? So we talked about trans-Neptunian object. They are also interesting for this kind of fifth force study. Now, furthermore, you can also study star and all that different things, even the neutron star merger. And people have actually studied a lot of these objects already. So they can all give you certain constraint or some interesting feature for these fifth force. But uh, these stellar systems are not measured as precisely as near Earth objects because they are so far away. And also their time scale is much larger because if you have two stars rotating with each other or things like that, uh, it usually takes longer time. So not 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 necessarily depends on which star, but but the the near Earth objects, their rotation is about like one year or less. So you can actually see the precession very easily, and that's why for now we're sticking to asteroid. But certainly the other object has been studied for fifth force. So there's many many different study for neutron star, for supernova, or for many other different kind of channel, and they provide different kind of constraint or interesting indication. Now, here comes the last question, and it's the hard and crazy one. So mining asteroids. We, oh, are, wow. we, are, we are entering a, a period where we, it may be economically viable or necessary, even if we, if we start colonizing space and building O'Neill cylinders, to mm -hmm. start mining asteroids. Does the fifth force or anything like that really affect that? I mean, could that be a factor that something that, <laughs> that if it, if it exists, that we have to factor in when we go and mine asteroids? So uh, certainly, I, I mean, the quick uh, question, quick answer is no, but it's, this is a very, very interesting question from a different angle that I look at. So I certainly, I'm not the space conquer type of person. I am interested in understanding the space better than conquering them or mining them. I think conquering them or mining them is what Elon Musk and other people can do. And I'm not necessarily uh, part of that, uh, that uh, group of people. But this is a very interesting um, topic that I actually think there are some collaboration we can do. So the idea is we want to actually put some technology on asteroids or on the moon. I mean, we already did on the moon, but we can do more. So with Professor Safranova in uh, Delaware, we are thinking about putting atomic clock on the moon. So you can do a lot of precision study, study a lot of different fundamental physics. And for asteroids, we can actually put laser ranging. So you can put a mirror and do the laser ranging or do, to put a transponder onto it. And you can track it better, and you can also understand a lot of the, its nature. And these certainly are along the same direction as if you want to mine the, the asteroid, right? Because if you want to mine the asteroid, first you have to land on it properly. And you have to also understand its property. So before mining them, maybe let's do some fundamental physics. Let's put a mirror on it first. Let's uh, do some less aggressive things on it first. Let's do put a atomic clock uh, on it first. So there is a group uh, led by Peter Graham, uh, Sergio Rajan, Peter Graham at Stanford, uh, Sergio Rajanja in John Hopkins University, and Michael Fredeke in John Hopkins University. They also want to put atomic clock on the asteroid just to see gravitational wave. So I actually chatted with uh, Peter and I want to just use the tracking of the asteroids to study gravitational wave. And that's something I call asteroid tracking array. It's kind of like pulsar timing array. We can actually probably see gravitational wave, but this is very preliminary. I just want to mention that. There's a huge amount of uh, new development that we can do with asteroids, not necessarily just mining them, but, but at least one thing we can learn from mining them is we can know its composition much better, right? And we can uh, also develop our technology in that sense. So even though I'm not a space conqueror or asteroid miner, 
uh, there are something we can collaborate on because they are probably going to go anyway. So uh, why why don't we do some fundamental physics together? I, I have no way to stop them or or have opinions. So so it, it's good to collaborate on studying uh, fundamental physics. Okay, I got another question for yeah. you, and this is just yeah. entirely a a completely off the wall question. <laughs> no worries. You're yeah. not a space conqueror, and neither am I. I, I look at going to space as being too far away from my coffee pot, so I <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to function without the coffee. And let let let's not lie, uh, NASA coffee and space coffee and all that's probably not as good. Would you even go to space? I mean, I if, would. If you... I would. I would actually. So, so sorry. Uh, maybe you have a follow up. Uh, you have, please finish. No, it. no, go for it. So, it's fascinating. Who have up the opportunity to go to space? Of course, we don't know if space wants us to go there, right? I mean, we're designed to live on Earth, but because uh, I'm a scientist, it's very fascinating to when they have the opportunity to go to space and then maybe learn something that uh, otherwise you cannot learn. And and this is completely aligned with some of the plan that people have. So. Obama actually had a plan to have people land on asteroids. I think so. That yes. so not not I think so. I actually know there's a document for that. So there is a, a plan to put uh, people on asteroids. And again, I'm not the uh, I, I don't care about politics, but uh, that's something very exciting. And if I can be the first group of people to go to the asteroid, not to conquer it, just to see how what's up and see if there are weird uh, stuff there. That would be very cool, and uh, I don't know if I can survive that, but uh, that's a good idea. And maybe they will send me to to do some fundamental physics. There. I don't know. It's it's, it's well. There's there's the, within that whole idea, within yeah. that whole uh, exploration yeah. of going to an asteroid, there was the idea of bringing one here for study mm-hmm. as well. So somehow. And I, I could never really quite wrap my head around it, but somehow the idea of diverting an asteroid and bringing it here to in order to study it whenever we want, I guess, um, was floated. But I, I, I can't think of a way we, we could do that with our current. Well, so what, what does that mean? Is it a big one or a small one? If it's a big well, one, I think it was a very that... small one. It was the idea right. is find find a very small asteroid, bring it back, put it in I don't know a Lagrange point or something and make it available for study and i was like how do you even do that but then i thought even for their future the idea of shooting asteroids around to divert objects gravitationally is something maybe we'll do thousands of years from now so we might start passing asteroids around objects in the solar system in order to manipulate them but wouldn't we increase the chance of them hitting us because of we do that oh yeah but th- we always make mistakes I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's the kind of things we do. <laughs> it might be the way we like, uh, this might be the way we, we go, right? This might, might actually be how we end our... Human uh, civilization <laughs> was ended by asteroid manipulation. All right, you, we are out of time. And thank you for joining us. And um, I hope you'll come back at some point when your next paper comes out. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.